So Stephen, how does the pure function, how are the reactions on the new material, the raven that refused the signal? Uh, so far so good. Um, yeah, we've, um, we've done seven shows so far, I think, seven or eight shows so far. Still, still kind of feeling our way through the new material ourselves. Uh, it takes time to settle in. To, uh, it's a new new lineup. Well, it's the new guitar player, so the the balance has changed a little bit. Um, but it's it's shaping up really nicely, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And the last time you started the tour, or when the concert started, you played behind the Prince Laurent curtain. Right. It was an interesting effect, but mm. everybody asked, "What should that be? If this curtain will he play the whole mm. concert behind this curtain?" Mm. So. Do you have any such things in the show today? Yeah. yeah. I don't want to tell you too much about it because it's spoiler, but yeah, we have... Uh, you know, I like the idea of, of making it something visually interesting. It, just the idea of six guys on stage playing their instruments, playing the music, for me is not enough. Uh, no. So I love the gores. I love the fact that the audience were a little bit uncomfortable about it because they didn't know if they were going to see the whole show through. Because when that, of course, meant that the curtain did finally come down in the fourth song, it was a great moment. Every, yeah, every night yeah, was a really yeah. exciting <laughs> moment. Uh, we're not we're not doing that again because it's, but we're doing we, we're using similar devices here. Mm -hmm. The last time we were spoken, we discussed what will be the follow-up for Grace for Drowning. Mm. Will it be a new solo album mm. or will it be a new Porcupine Tree album? Mm. So you have decided to make a new fantastic solo album. Yes. So what was the reason for this decision? Well, I, I think partly because I just had such a great time on, with these guys on the tour. And, and they really, for me, they really f uh, found a chemistry and an, ele an electricity in the music that I wanted to, that I felt like I wanted immediately to write an album that would take advantage of that chemistry and, and that I would be able to take this band into the studio and capture it somehow. So I, I guess I was inspired by the, the way that the music mm -hmm. sounded on the Grace Train. Yes, it's an outstanding masterpiece and yeah, I guess the Porcupine Tree was progressive rock with the accent on rock and your solo work is progressive rock with the accent on being progressive in the way you play. It's jazzy, it's, yeah, it has, has got elements of yeah, psychedelic music. So would you agree and what was the reason for this switch? I don't really intellectualize it too much, but, I, but I th one thing I think you're right about is that the, there was a sense in Porcupine Tree that there was a, 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 an element missing for me which was the more spiritual element that I suppose you would connect with jazz. Um, the improvisational qualities, the, the, the freshness that every night when you walk on stage with musicians that can perform that way and can improvise that way makes the music always much more fresh and of the moment. And you don't get that with the more clinical approach of rock music. Porcupine Tree, every night we played the show, it was exactly the same. Yeah. The same notes, the solos were the same. Because I'm, you know, but for speaking for myself as a guitar player, I'm not good enough to improvise something different every night. I have to learn my part and then I play oh, yeah. the song every night. I'm not good enough to do it. But one of the, so I kind of missed, what I missed about that was that the show was kind of a bit stale, you know, from probably for the audience too, you know. So I, I felt like the next thing I do, I want to be working with musicians that can bring back some of that spirituality and, oh, yeah. and, and freshness and improvisational qualities. So it is, each concert differs from the one before. Very so, much. Yeah. Every, every night yeah. is like a, <laughs> a, a journey, an exploration. I mean, of course, there is the structure of the show is yeah. the same. The songs are, the structures of the songs are the same. But all of the solos and the improvisational yeah, yeah, yeah. passages are different every night. I think we've got a really nice balance between structure yeah. and chaos, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the Raven that refused to sing in other stories that it picks up yeah, very ambitious subjects. You explained it on the internet, you, you have explained the lyrics. So where is the source for these kinds of lyrics? How did you come to this 
yeah, kind of material. Well, the idea firstly was to was to was to draw on the the tradition of the classical ghost story, uh, which I was I was reading a lot of those kind of stories at the, at the time I was writing the music, and I obviously I I, I, ha, I have a history of, of always liking to have an album have some kind of conceptual theme that runs through the whole record, and this time I thought okay it would be nice to do a set of short stories. Mm-hmm. And to present the album almost like a, a book yeah. of, of you know not not like a modern book but like a book from like a hundred years ago <laughs> of classical supernatural stories of the supernatural and so I started off by actually writing some stories some short stories without not thinking about lyrics just thinking about stories and then also starting to, fairly early on in the process to collaborate with the German artist Chaya Muller and yeah. uh, to talk about uh, how we might illustrate that kind of book, mm-hmm. or how would they have illustrated a book like that a hundred years ago, you know, in the early twentieth century, and trying to go for that kind of feeling in the music, the artwork, and the lyrics, and it all came together really, yeah. really beautifully. Yeah, fantastic. And I saw the video to yeah, the and the video record. too. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I love the whole album, six great songs, and the final song, the title track. Well, it's yeah, the quintessential song of this album, and I saw the video. It's totally marvelous. It's moved me very much. Yeah. So, um, will it be performed as well? And what was behind this fantastic um, video? Well, the video is is a fairly uh, faithful uh, adaptation of the short story that was a collaboration between yeah. myself and Hayo, which is about this old man towards the end of his life contemplating his own mortality, his own death, basically preparing f- for death, you know, and thinking back to his childhood when he had a very close relationship with his sister, who was the only person he ever really had a connection with, emotional connection with, who he lost as a very, lost, she died when they were young. And he's never formed any real close relationship with anybody else for the whole of his life. So he's been a very lonely man. So the song is about, you know, about many of the kind of things that I think interest me or obsess me. I think probably obsess most people, which is fear of death, this idea of loss, the idea of regret, um, not having used your life yeah. to the fullest, not having been happy in your life. Um, Those, those things are full of tragedy and full of pathos, and, but also in some way they're very beautiful because they are at the very heart of what it means to be a human being and to yeah. have the gift of life. So I think we all kind of relate to that, that, that story um, and that video in a very profound way. But it is a very sad, very beautiful yeah, piece. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah an old legend of yeah, producing and, yeah, and Alan Parsons was part of this project as an engineer and I guess he co-produced this album so how important was he for the sounding of the records the record <coughs> well I wanted I wanted the record to sound timeless um, now some people have said to me oh you wanted the record to sound like uh, an album from the 70s in a way they're right, but what I would say is I wanted the record to sound timeless, and I think records from the 70s actually do sound yeah. timeless, in a way that records from now don't, or records from 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, just don't. The thing about records from the 70s is they do almost transcend time. They sound beautifully golden and organic and natural in a way that, that a lot of modern records don't. I wanted this record to sound somehow out of time, so that you can listen to it in 50 years, 100 years, and it will still sound the same. Yeah. And that's also partly why the, the musical vocabulary I'm using is, is more things like piano, Hammond organ, mm-hmm. Fender Rhodes, Mellotron, acoustic guitar, woodwinds, harmony vocals. These things are timeless. Yeah. And Alan is part of that process, because Alan is a guy that, of course, learned his trade during the golden era of, of the explosion of, of um, ambitious yeah. or album-orientated music. The Beatles, Floyd, Floyd and his solo <laughs> records. 
They sound Al Stewart. They the beautiful sounding records that are timeless. They sound timeless. I wanted this record to sound timeless, so I hired Alan really to just make sure that that was all taken care of, and, and I could concentrate in a way on being the musical director and just leave him yeah, to, yeah. to to record everything. There was, was no problem for you to give up some duties. Well, not when it's Alan Parsons, no. <laughs> it's Because not uh, normally you making most of your production, yeah. most parts of your production. Yeah. So. Um, Well, I didn't really give up any production. I gave up all the engineering. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, Alan would still defer to me if you know, I had the final say. But I think it would have been harder to, if I'd been giving up that, if I'd, give, if I'd been trusting the responsibility of, of recording the album to someone that had less uh, of, a, of a track record. But when you, when you know that someone like Alan is, in, is involved, you, you can trust, you can let go. You know? yeah, it's, yeah, not, it's not like he's going to do a bad <laughs> job. So it was easy. It was yeah. easy to let him. It's, yeah, it's a very relaxed album. Yeah, it sounds very intact. And I saw it on... Wikipedia is recorded in just one week, is that right? Most of it. Um, we did, we did uh, seven days of recording in Los Angeles with, with Alan Engineering and with the band, and we recorded one track each day. We did seven tracks originally. One track is, is not on the record. So we did seven tracks, a track a day. I would say 80% of what you hear on the record was recorded live during that seven-day period. And then some vocals, some orchestral overdubs, some melodrum mm -hmm. overdubs when I got back, but most of the work, yeah. most of the work. But it's a very short time for recording the album and you were on tour yeah, with Grace but Rowling and two legs, you have produced the DVD and Storm mm -hmm. Corrosion, so when did you find the time to write all these songs and bring it to this point that you can record an album in nearly um, a week? Well. Okay, Storm Corrosion was all finished in 2011. Oh, yeah. It was finished a long time. Yeah. It came out in May, May last year. It all finished. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, this album was written between January and July last year. We did do a short tour in April and May, which kind of interrupted oh, that yeah. process. But I wrote the music from January through to July. Quite, quite intense. It was hard work. Yeah. Quite yeah. intense. But I didn't have a lot of other stuff on. The Storm Corrosion album was already done and finished. The, the, the DVD took, the Blu-ray took a couple of weeks to mix and edit, of course, that tour. But I, I probably worked a good three or four months solidly on, on developing the material. And, yeah. and the guys were all, the bands, the guys in the band were all involved in the demoing process oh, too. Yeah. So they were also learning the music as we went along. So by the time we got to, to California, Oh, and also Luminol, we played on the tour. We played that in. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we knew that one. So by the time we got to California in September, we kind of, we were ready. You know, structure was there, the songs were there, everyone had played them before, we all knew them. So it was like, okay, each day we'd come in, we'd run through a song a few times, we'd start recording, we'd do one, two, three, four takes, we'd listen, we'd choose the best one. <laughs> Maybe we'd go and do another fifth take or a sixth take if we felt that we could still do better. Done. It was recorded live in, live live in the studio. In the studio right? Live yeah. in the studio, yeah. It's amazing because most bands recorded in different layers. Well, I've always done that too. I've yeah. always done, this is the first time I've ever done a record yeah. live in the studio. And maybe it sounds so relaxed and so organic because of this live situation I think so. in the studio. I think so. I think I learned, I definitely learned something doing it this way. So yeah. It was scary. It was a bit scary for me to lose that control, but the results, I think, speak mm -hmm. for themselves. There are three epics on it, Lumino, The Holy Drinker and The Watchmaker, but you don't get the impression that these songs are long songs. Right. Because they are so interesting, so then I checked yeah, the sheet and saw oh, such long songs. So how do you create this? Because many progressive rock bands, if they do have a long track, sometimes, but in any case, but sometimes it is boring, but this is very uh, intact and interesting. So how do you create a good epic song? Like, like, like you would create a good movie or a good, or yeah. a good novel. So you have, you, if you think of the various themes in the song as characters and the characters have to develop and, and the, the, uh, 
the story has to unfold in a satisfying way and reach a satisfying conclusion. That's not easy, I have to yeah, say, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and, and some of the early versions of these songs were very different, structurally very different, yeah. sometimes longer maybe, different sections which I took out or put in a different place, and it's almost like you're putting together a jigsaw puzzle and you have to find the right structure for the mm -hmm. song, the structure that feels the most satisfying, yeah. the journey that feels the most yeah. logical. And you know, I've learned I've learned to do that over the years because I have written some long pieces over the years, some of which were more successful than others. You know, and and I think you learn by your mistakes, and you learn how to keep an, a, a kind of a narrative moving, <laughs> exactly the way you would if you were a scriptwriter or a novel writer. Oh, you, know? Yeah. you know, sometimes you that scene goes on too long, or, or you know, or that character doesn't work. Let's take him out, or that scene there would have been better earlier in the film. You know, let's move that scene to an earlier... And that's exactly what I'm doing with the music. Yeah. I have all these sections and I'm finding the right way for them to all yeah. connect together. Well, yeah. Interesting. And, yeah, how do you see your musical progress from the, the first solo album to this? Was this great opus just possible because you did two good solo albums before? Or, um, can't you see any musical evolvement or development in your music? Well, I, th I see both. I mean, the thing is, I'm very good at moving sideways, too. So, like, some people, like, ev you know, every album is like an evolution from yeah. the previous album. But I also quite like to go sideways sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So my first solo album, In Sohentis, was more, um, had more of an alternative sound to it, more use of noise and electronics. And then Grace for Drowning was more about the the um, the connection between jazz and progressive music. It was very different to Insanity. This album, I think, has elements of both those records, but it's different again. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I always like the idea of every album kind of existing in its own world, its own universe. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm sure there is... The, seed, the seeds of this album, I think, were planted in, in Grace for Drowning with the... The introduction of a stronger influence of jazz music, uh, longer pieces. Um, so, I think there is a sense of development from that record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And when you pick up your career with Porcupine Dream one day again, or is it still open? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, maybe. Maybe. I don't, yeah. There's yeah. no plans. There's no plans. I guess it's a good decision because you're open for new kinds of influence yeah, and exactly. you're not focused on one project. Maybe that's just one aspect for your great music. Well, one thing I've learned about this business, and of course I should have known this anyway, is that you, if you have a successful brand or successful band, most people expect you to just keep doing that over and over and over and over yeah. again. Uh, and to be fair, most most that is what most bands do. You know, when they're successful, they keep doing. But I've never really been able to to get into that particular mindset. Um, I think if if you've got something to say musically with yeah. a project, then say it. If you haven't, don't. You know, do something else. And I'm having a lot of fun. You know, with with new new music and new musicians, and uh, and it's doing very well. You know, Germany is doing <laughs> uh, very well. So number three in the charts this this week, which is better than anything I've ever achieved with. Porcupine Tree. Yeah. So it's not like I have to go back to Porcupine Tree because it's more successful. Yeah. It isn't. You know, it's different and I know there are some fans that prefer it to what I do and there are some fans that prefer what I do now to Porcupine Tree. But the most important thing is that I feel it's what I want. I yeah, want to yeah, do. Um, do you see bands that pick up your music today? Well, when you hear other bands and say, oh, they are influenced yeah. by Porcupine Tree, for example. Yeah, very much, or, yeah. That it comes back, you were influenced by uh, Genesis, yes, and other bands of the 70s, but um, now you see bands that pick up your. Heritage. Well, I, I, was, I was always inspired by Crimson and Floyd, not Genesis, and yes, but anyway, but, but I take so, your point. I take your point. I, uh, yeah. I take your point. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's very flattering. There are some great bands that I can hear the influence of, of, of Porcupine Tree in. And uh, I'm very proud, you know, bands like Riverside, you know, Riverside? Yeah, exactly. And Pineapple Thief and, and that basic anathema. And I see a whole kind of generation 
uh, of bands that definitely are, are come, come out of what maybe I started and and um, that's fantastic you know but they all have their own style too which is which is important all right Steve mm -hmm. okay. thank you for this nice interview my great success with thank this you. tour and record America and maybe Japan I hope so too and Australia too hopefully yeah yeah, yeah. yeah thank you very much okay thank you always a pleasure